The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Wow, that's one of those things where <clears throat> what, what happened this morning is what you least want to happen before you start speaking and you're <laughs> supposed to start. <laughs> it's like, how can I follow up with that, all that awesomeness that God is, right? But um, in, in realistically, um, wow, worship was awesome. Did you, how many of you did you feel the anointing this morning? Oh, yeah. It was so good. <clears throat> you know, there was a, last week I, we, I, I shared a little bit about the pursuit, well, it's the pursuit of God, and that's what this title is for this one t- as well. Um, but it was the pursuit, and we showed how God pursues us continually with his love. And how much we're worth, the pearl of great price to him. And, and the thing is, is when you accept it, there's, there's two groups of people that don't quite get it. That would be the ones that don't feel like they need one, a relationship with God. Or the other is, I'm not worth it. Why, why would... I'm irreparable. I'm irreparable, right? Or I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. And I heard a a young lady tell me this week, and it broke my, it breaks my heart because I know what she went through. And she said, I'm too far gone. I'm too broken. I'm irreparable. I'm too damaged, and I always am going to be damaged. And those are heartfelt, that's a heartfelt statement. Whether or not she believes the facts of those things cause her to be broken, it's not the truth. And it's not what God wants. And, if, and I think somebody out there, not just her, but I felt like this through the whole service, is no matter how far you've gone, how far you fell, how tired you are, that if you just turn to me, says the Lord, just turn, give me a chance. I will run to you. I will make it up to you. I will restore you to where I need you to be, says the Lord. It's not too late, bloodied and broken. It's not too late if you just turn I know you don't maybe not have the strength. You feel like you're done it all and it's it's too late, it's too bad, it's too much. He just needs you to a glimpse. I don't know who that's for, but I felt it really strong in the service. And Lord, I pray that they be touched right now. Whoever that is, if you're in the service, you could raise your hand, but if you're not and you know somebody that is, raise your hand. We just Praise you, Father. We just thank you for that open door, that, that little, little, little tiny open door, that, that crack that you could actually get in. They might be too weak, too tired, too damaged to open the door all the way, but Lord, take what they have and work. Lord, we thank you, Father. Tissue. Sorry. Does anybody have a tissue I can I can grab? <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> Whew. This week, last week we had my mother-in-law at the house, and this week they 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 swapped places, and I got the father-in-law. 
It's, all, it's awesome. I love, I love my family. So Gwen's dad, <clears throat> my wife's dad, was there. And um, he, he did, uh, he actually built uh, our, he took our, our family room upstairs and, and built it into Landon's new bedroom. So now Landon can get out of our closet because he's been living in our, uh, literally living in our closet. I feel, and I, we had to get him out. <laughs> he's going to, before he could actually remember back, you know, he's old enough to remember, hey, I lived in the closet. How come something's wrong? Oh. And I know I had mentioned that I had mentioned uh, the diet that, that Gwen and I were on last week and how, how difficult it is and, and everything. But I started having these really strange dreams. And, and, and Stacy, you were in this dream I had last night. I know I'm going to mention your name, but you're not on the, I'm not going to show you on camera, so you're okay. Thank you. I said, <laughs> you're welcome. It was the strangest dream, too. It was like, this has nothing to do with the message, by the way. But I, I, I had to say this because it was weird. Uh, I have this, I have, the, the, one of the cravings that I've had with this, with this diet is chocolate. And I, I mentioned last time Heath bars, which is, you know, co- chocolate covered English toffee. Oh. And so I had this dream, I had this dream last night and I woke up and I thought, oh my gosh, this is so weird. That I was out in some neighborhood and, and, I, and I had a job to do at some house. And I'm not sure even what that job was supposed to be. But Stacy comes running out of the street. This is one of the, the ladies here in the congregation, she runs out in the street. She's like, hey, I got this for you. I don't think I could eat it, but I think maybe you could. And, and, I, and I looked down, and it was a Snickers. It was like a Snickers bar or Milky Way, and it was, and it was all wrapped up. But it's a brand new kind that, they don't, that I never heard of before. And it was made, <laughs> get this, it was chocolate covered, right? So I was like, okay, I'm into it. And I bit into it, and it was green inside. I was like, hmm. But it was, I still ate it, and I thought it was great. And in the dream, I actually tasted it, which is really wild. But it was, <laughs> it was filled with, it was filled with uh, uh, smashed uh, squash and zucchini. And there was dark, yeah, there was dark layers of, of liquefied broccoli <laughs> in between. The, the awesome nougat uh, <laughs> of the, yeah, you, so, you can, so you know what I'm eating right now is just broccoli and zucchini and, but I loved it in the dream. I, I thought it was awesome. I was like, yeah, chocolate on it. Wow. Anyway, uh, we are, we are, we, I'm, I'm requesting your prayers and I, and I really, and I know that it's a God, it's a God timing thing is that uh, Gwen and I and Jennifer, um, are going to be speaking to the CSCL students on Tuesday and Wednesday this week, okay? And the 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 um, the topic is going to be it, it's going to be pretty much the the sexual issues seminar. A lot of you came uh, to that, and yeah, so we we need to we need to be supported in some prayer. Uh, if you do, if you, if you remember, and it comes to mind while you're doing your devotions or whatever, um, we would. Be grateful for that. The wisdom that you need in order to speak to, to, uh, you know, eighth grade, 13 and up, is is a lot different in order to reach uh, than the adults. To make it relevant to them and what they're, you know. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to leave out, and there's there's not there's not pertinent to them, and there's a lot of things that we're going to, um, you know. Uh, expound upon that that wasn't really stretched you know out on during the module or the the seminar so anyway that yeah we don't have a hundred percent of what we're going to be doing but uh but god but god knows so last week i i touched on the the pearl of great price and that we are the pearl of great price which is an awesome uh revelation if you could actually catch it and um it's what he desires. He desires us, which is another thing. If we never even thought about it, yeah, he desires us. But if we receive it as revelation, it'll, it'll knock your socks off. He's in continual pursuit of intimacy and relationship with us. 
we learn that he created us to be pursued by him forever. We learn that he finds pleasure in his people, he sings over us, and we are his delight. He's concerned for us, knows us, and intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And that's in Psalm 139. We should be persistent and desire to sacrifice extravagantly for his relationship with us. Right? He did it for us. We also learned about Jesus being the bridegroom and how Christ loves the church. And that's how he pursues us. But... How do we respond to his unfailing pursuit? This is our job. This is our, t- it's our turn. It's what happens in response. And we feel like sometimes when you, when you, when you read through scriptures like Psalm 139, where he's, he's intimately knows you in, in every facet of, of, of your existence, even prior to your being formed in, your, in the womb. It's hard to, to think that we could actually express ourselves back to him in the same way. That's what he desires. But we can, and that's what we were actually made for. And if you think that you're made for anything else, um, you're going to be really disappointed in life. My dad shared with me the other day was something that was really, really awesome. I can't remember who he he got it from. Somebody from, not Watchman Nee's Apprentice type. But he said, <clears throat> there's three, three, three things in life that you need to read. And I love this, so I'm, I'm repeating it, and I'm sure you'll hear it in some of his messages. Number one, the Bible. It's kind of a, a given. Two, anything that brings life and peace inside you. Pay attention to it. Take notes of it. What's going on that causes peace or life to come up in you. And three, your environment. And, and, and just that statement, I, I was looking at some of the, the, the things that I had prepared for today. And, and basically, it's, it's the pursuit of God, but it's our pursuit for him. And there's been, I don't know, 10 million books probably on the subject. But I, I know that this is timely. So I'm going to kind of expound on what God shared with me revelation-wise. He took me first to Luke 15, and a lot of parables in in Luke 15, I think we even talked about a couple last week, but Luke 15 is where the, um, this is the parable of the the son that was lost, the, the, the prodigal son, and a few others, but in order to get a good, a good idea of, of of how Jesus is, what Jesus' heart is for the lost. I mean, it, he, it shows us that he is the one that goes after the one that's lost, leaves the 99. Doesn't make sense to me. It sounds like bad business logic to me. But he does because it shows his father's heart towards the lost. And, I, and so then after I read it and I was like, oh, this is, a, this is his character. And this is the, the love for the lost. And, and if these, these folks are, are righteous already, then they can, they can deal for a few minutes while I go find this sheep that's lost, right? <laughs> well, anyway, but what I was trying to put it in perspective is a lot of times when we read things out of, out of context, we kind of come up with our own uh, definitions of what we're reading instead of really what it really means. And to get a good idea of what, it, what, this, what Jesus is doing here and, the part, and a picture of him is that when we, when we read in verse 1 and 2, I was like, who is he speaking to? You know, when he's talking about these parables, who is he trying to reach? And verse one in in, uh, Luke 15, it says, then all the tax collectors and sinners, Pharisees and scribes. And so that's why he spoke the parable to them. I was like, okay, so we have have two groups of people and and we come across these two groups a lot in ministry. And it's, it's those that, don't think they need help, which would be a picture of the Pharisee. They, they're the religious. They know everything already. And we come across these today as well. The other group is the despised, the, the tax collectors, the 
the broken people that are beyond repair. But Jesus meets them both where they are through the parables. He reads his environment. He responds with wisdom to each crowd, each type of, of person individually. And this is, this is my prayer for, for us as well, is that when we're, when we're trying to witness to people, when we're trying to get through, you know, get through to people that we are actually expressing love to them, that it's, that it's unique to each individual person. Love is, in, is unique. God's way of, of, of pulling out the gold from people is unique for each individual person. And it has to remain unique. It's not, there's not just an ABC123 for everybody. It's not, that, it's not that way. And so we have to pray for wisdom and how to approach the situation because truth without love is, is, is death. You can kill them and turn them off. But truth with love will bring, will bring transformation. So the pursuit of God, part two, our response. God is pursuing us. He is actively, patiently, and passionately wooing our hearts. And he is driven by this one desire to find people who would respond to his pursuit and seek him back. The eyes of the Lord are attentively and incessantly scanning the earth to find these men and women who understand that he longs for intimacy with us And he wants us to long for intimacy with him. It's so funny when we, we come to a certain place in our lives and we, and, and we actually check ourselves like this, we sometimes are, um, are kind of afraid of what we turned into. That th there's so many things that distract us and pull us away and draw us out you know, in life. But when we, when we, so then we, it's every once in a while we get back to, wow, how's my pursuit going? You know? And then, and then you kind of get a, oh. But it's good to do every once in a while. Check yourself. Our divine husband is, look, is seeking like-minded bride who would care as much about his heart as he cares about hers. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah, there was, it was called the weeping prophet because he had basically to prophesy the doom and gloom that God told him to, talk, to tell them. But it was about the nation that he loved and the people that he loved and he cared for. So he, it, it was like he was very emotional throughout, right? And Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. When God said he would tell them of great and hidden things that, that they had not known when they called on him, he was reminding them to rest in his promises and his character. He was reminding them to rest in his promises and character. He was calling them to remember that he was God and he was the ruler and king over every great and hidden mystery. God is the same way today. He wants us to call in his name and watch in wonder as he plays his role. God wants to restore that. That, that wide-eyed wonder, anything can happen, all things can happen. The whole thing started when back, back at the end of last year with that, that statement, all things can happen, anything's possible with God. If we really, if we're in our prayer time and we soak in that, all things are possible. Anything can happen. We, in our lowest times, in our down times, can reflect on his promises. And when we reflect on our prom his promises, it stabilizes us in our, in our walk so that we don't get, the, get to be the down and outs. And that's what ca he calls us to do. Remember that I am God and I answer you and I will and I will tell you 
marvelous, awesome, wonderful, hidden things, mysteries that you don't know. This is why we pray. We pray to commune with God, to remind ourselves of his promises and to worship him as the one true God over everything. Amen? Prayer is essential. It's talking with God. It's having a relationship with God. Prayer is being with somebody. You can't build relationship if you're not with somebody. You can't. One of the best things you can do when you're trying to build relationship is over dinners, over lunches, face-to-face, breath-to-breath. That's how you build relationship. There, there's a, a powerful, we have a powerful message that my dad uh, speaks about of intimate prayer and seeking intimacy with God, both we have on the table back there. But it, it is such an awesome thing when we actually experience that intimacy and, and experience its growth when we allow ourselves to. If you have never felt God, the presence of the, of the Lord, you can. You're not special. You're not broken. He is there completely all the time waiting and ready for you to just ask and let your guard down. He is a good, good father. He is a good, good God. There is no good beside him. And all love emanates and started from him. Holy love. God is awesome. I love, I love that song that we, we did this morning. The, I look at the work, works of your hands and, and the, the, the spinning galaxies. And, and you know, all these things mean nothing to him. But we do. All these giant things that he created, all this stuff, we're so much more important to him. We just need to be able to give him that benefit of the doubt that we are, we are important. And then he'll go with it and he'll run with it. He wants to lavish upon you. He wants to lavish his love upon you. Prayer is essential and for a vibrant and healthy relationship. And that's with God, that's with people, that's in your family. It's communion. In Matthew, I, I, we, we looked at Matthew uh, 13, verse 44 and 46 last week, which was um, the, the two parables of one of the, the, the treasure hidden in the field and the other was the seeker seeking the fine pearls, the, the pearl of great price. And I, and I, and I expounded a little bit upon it, um, but the way that I, I had misinterpreted the, I, I thought they were both exactly the same, but when you look at them, they're not. When, when, God was, uh, when Jesus was trying to explain the kingdom of heaven, he was again doing you know, what he did in, in Luke chapter 15. Was he, was, he read his environment, and he's expounding now to where they, they could hear. Because those that, why, why, did, why were the parables created, first of all, first and foremost? Because they had ears that did not hear. Yeah? hearts that wouldn't receive him that it was one of those things that they were they were they were deaf and they were blind and the only way to get to him was through their current situation their current societal situations and so that Jesus uses those things to touch them but anyway let's look at this Matthew 13 44 and 46 the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again and from joy over it, he goes and sells all he has to buy that field. And you go down uh, to the next verse. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one great pearl of value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Just to fill you in on, on, on the storyline here in the, in the back, background. In Jesus' day, acquiring wealth was kind of a, a sketchy thing. And, and, and storing it was even worse. It was hard. And so if you had large items, it was really easy to get taken from you. You could, you know, or, or whatnot, um, through government, through war, through. So what happens was, is when, when this, uh, 
people um, would find or come across a jewel or a pearl or things that were relatively small, they would hide them. They would, they would sell all they had and purchase, or they'd go back and purchase if they did find somebody selling such. And, but they would sell everything they had, big, huge amounts of things, to get the, the one pearl because it was easily hidden. And they could either keep it on their person, but most of the time they would hide it in just like they, the, the, the treasure hidden in the field. They would go hide it in a field or a notch of a tree or, or whatnot so that it couldn't be taken from them. But it wasn't so unpop. I mean, it wasn't so uncommon that these people of wealth would uh, pass away suddenly, or something would happen, and then there would be no location known of those treasures and and those things, and and forever they would be lost, until a tr a seeker or a treasure finder, um, just like back in the, the the old days of Texas of the gold mining and wherever it was. It was. They would come across, just like in the story, they would come across something and such, and they would find it, they would bury it, and then they would sell all they had and to purchase it, the, the field that it was buried in. So he was speaking as culturally what, would ha what was very common for them back in the day, that there would be seeker hunters, I mean, uh, treasure hunters back in the day running the fields and periodically looking where, where it's possible if they found a treasure map of some sort or whatever, but they would always wanted to, they, they, there was groups of people that did that just so that they could find wealth, hit it, hit it big. Um, but just like, like I was saying, just like in Luke, Jesus reads the environment and explains to them according to the wisdom that he, he had. Um, he, because it was a cultural norm, he was able to relate the kingdom of heaven in a way that they would understand and not close off to him. And, and it's the same way when we're trying to witness to somebody that, that's in, in turmoil. And it's like, you really want to express the love to them, but, but you, want to, you, want to have to have, you want to have wisdom in, in their environment. What, where are they coming from? You didn't walk in their shoes. We can't, we can't just judge by somebody how they look. It's impossible. We, we have to actually see, let, allow uh, Jesus in, the, in, in you to give you wisdom to see exactly what's happening in their life and, and give them the answers. And those, those are things that we're not used to doing. We're used to reading and studying so that we have an answer. Well, yeah, study to show yourself approved. Yes, of course. But when you're, but when you're reaching the lost, it was, it's, pure spirit. There's nothing, you can't, you can't get anybody set free without God. You can't. So you have to fully, you have to come to a, a, a place where you, no, you don't know everything about everybody, and you're not going to know, and you are. I know you are. Jesus, the Lord spoke it to me even while they were doing, before they did the prophecy for you, that that he's going to give you glimpses and wisdom about people and their circumstances, and you're going to be able to speak life and peace into them. Amen? Amen. I want that for everybody. I want that for myself. It's so necessary. It's so necessary because we don't look, as Christians, we don't look real. A lot of us are just, we just go to church we're, we're happy about some stuff, we're sad about it, we have life, how life happens, and, and we get down and depressed. We look like everybody else to, some, to, to most. Why would they want what we have? We have to actually get the exchange life, exchange our life for His, walk His walk, and start acting out these things that he's speaking to us. We have to develop that intimate relationship. We have to respond to his calling and his wooing and do it back. Because if, without the deepening of that relationship between us and God, we're not going to know anything. We're going to walk up to somebody and, and, and they're going to say, help me, help me. And you're going to be like, And those are the hard, even the hard cases that don't, they don't think they need it. They don't want it. 
or the ones that are the down and outs. I can relate softer more to the down and outers because I was one. But there's an answer for everybody. Otherwise, he wouldn't have died for all of us. He would have died just for some. Amen. There's an answer. There's a way out. There's help. There's hope. And people need to know it around you. That there's help. There's hope. There's a way. If people aren't, are, are around you and they're familiar with you as a friend or, or even a, a, you know, somebody that you associate with on and off and on, they need, if they don't know that comes from you, coming from Christ in you, then there's something wrong with that relationship. There's something wrong maybe with you and your relationship with God. They need to know. It's awesome. The, intermin <clears throat> the intermingling of these two pursuits, his and ours, is like a, a, the will, how it in, in his will and our will, they, they entwine with each other. It's a beautiful interaction between two lovers. And it can happen, you can experience this. It's the way it's supposed to be. I just want to encourage you this morning. He gave everything because we are that pearl of great price. He gave everything to acquire it. He gave everything. From the beginning of time, he is chasing us. He's wooing us. He's drawing us because his creation is, it's so, he is so important. We are so important to him that he gave all Every time that we screwed up, and that doesn't even mean when we're on the right. When we're in the right, when we're in the wrong, he continues to pursue. When, you know, even in, like what, what I was reading in the, in the, in the prodigal son, and I, and I had the, the, the parable kind of messed up based on my, my viewpoint of God was, okay, well, he let him go. He had to go do his own thing. He had to bottom out, and then he, and then he had to return to God. That's basically how I saw the parable. But there's so much more to the Father's aspect of that. And I didn't see it until now, which is he has continually, he had to set, in order to see, the one statement that got me was, he saw his son from afar off. And, that, and, that, and that's what got me. The Father's heart is continually searching. I, just even, I even read it in the small Psalms. He's continually searching the earth for somebody that wants to respond to him. It's the same as the, as the father sitting on his front porch or standing in his field, continually scanning the horizon for his coming son. He had to have been waiting there. He had to have set time apart. That's pursuit. He let him go because that's what had, that's, he had to do that. But he constantly searched the horizon for his return and expecting that's our God. No matter where we're at, He's continue, he, he is always, His love is always flowing towards us. There's, no matter how far we've gone, whether it's the pig pen and, and the prostitutes or even the elder brother who was always close to the Father but had, the, had a wrong attitude. He didn't need help. He was the, the Pharisee in the, in the group. Seeking God means letting my, my yearning heart meet his yearning heart. It's a beautiful interaction between two lovers. I don't reach out to get his attention or win his affection. That's, our, that's not my goal. That's not our goal. I reach out to, me, to meet his loving gaze, to meet him face to face, to have relationship. I reach out so that I could respond to him pursuing me. I don't seek him to stir his heart. I seek him because his heart is always stirred for me. Isn't that good? His heart burns for us. His desire for us is stronger than the grave. Death. 
How do we respond back? Why, why don't we? It's like we could, we, we could burst with the amount, of, uh, the amount of love and acceptance that comes from God. It feels like we would just bust. <laughs> it's amazing to me how approachable God makes himself. And thank you, Lord, that he does. He's not hiding somewhere. He's not concealing himself from mankind. He hasn't made it difficult or complicated to find him at all. It's not a special privilege reserved for only a few select. Like I said, he didn't die for just some. He gave all for all. He wants to be found, and he wants to be known. In Isaiah 52, 6, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I love that. And the thing is, is it says in here, and I, and I misinterpreted this as well sometimes, when you say you seek me with all your heart, which it doesn't mean dead works. You don't seek me. You don't read the, the, the word just because you know you have to put your 20 minutes in every day or whatever you want to do. It's not, a, it's not that kind of law. It is an attitude of the heart. And that's what he responds to. He responds to the heart. Responding to God's pursuit of us by pursuing him back is the purpose of life. I mean, if, if anybody struggles, especially some of the young people, who I have no, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what my purpose is. The purpose is that you pursue God. He created you for pursuit, and then you pursue him back. You will find your answers. Everything else will come. You pursue God first. Run as fast as you can. If somebody catches up, introduce yourself. That was my dating philosophy before I met Gwen. <clears throat> Every detail of our lives, he designed with the sole intention that we would seek him, that we would reach out to him, and that we would find him. We get our meaning and fulfillment completed when we appropriate that revelation in our life. Complete fulfillment in our meaning for existence is summed up in just that one, that one thing, is that you pursue God. In Acts 17, it says, <clears throat> And he made, <clears throat> he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times, your appointed times. Yeah? And where they would be living. And that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. So he has put us on the timeline where we are right now. He has placed us where you are right now. For what? What purpose? That they would seek God as if they would be groping for him. Oh, that's my purpose? He's in control of all that. He put us here at this time and place and showed us where we should be living where should, and we should be seeking him. It's, it's very plain in the scriptures. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God is love, 1 John. Before the foundation of the earth, God has longed for a passionate, holy, eternal love, a story with human beings his creation. We were designed for love and love alone. This is why we exist. This is what everything comes down to in uh, Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. It's so funny how terrible that the, I mean, it's not funny. 
it's terrible how, how the enemy uses and twists his love because nobody fully understands it. Even back in the day when, you know, when, when Jesus was speaking to Peter and, and Jesus was saying, do you love me? Was it Peter? It was Peter. And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. But, he's, but they, even back then, he, they used two different ways of love. The, the, the God love that emanates from God is agape, which is completely selfless, um, you know, and holy. Where Peter then replies back to him in a different type. Yes, I, I love you like a friend or I love you like a relative. You know, and so even back then we get it screwed up. But nowadays when we have these, we, we, we have these kids in schools and, and you keep, you just, you, you, you get reminded of the Beatles song, all you need is love, love, right? Because that's what they're saying nowadays. Everything's just love, love, love. If that's what the heart wants, the heart wants that, then it, that's okay. Even if it's completely, you know, disgusting. If you want to marry your vacuum cleaner, you can do it. You know, it's, it's like, what? Love, love, love. But because it, it, it and, and the Lord told me something real, real, real simple about true love. That God is the source of love. He was the original maker of it, and he is it. So when you say, I love Doritos, or I love my dog, you know, and you say, I love Jesus, what, what, what kind of love are you actually saying? Are they all on the same level? Because if they are, you're really screwed up. I mean, I, I'll, I'll take your prayer appointment personally. But anyway, but the thing is, is, True love, what he told me was true love, because it originated from God and it flows from God continually. There's, there's three things that God told me. And it's not, I know there's a whole love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that love is this and this and this. But if you're looking at people that have, have been in church their whole lives, they, we sometimes dismiss that stuff. I mean, not me personally, but there's, there's people that dismiss some of the stuff that they hear over and over again. But the Lord spoke to me, to my heart, um, and I'll probably share it with CSCL students, is that, number one, there's three things about this love that you want to know it's, if it's true love or not. True love is, number one, it's others-oriented. It doesn't take. It doesn't say, I prefer this over that. It's all about the other. It's others-oriented. Number two, it's completely selfless. Now, all of these might have been covered in 1 Corinthians 13, but these were the points that I needed to, that I think the Lord wanted me to share with the students this time around. Number one, it's others oriented. Number two, it's completely selfless. And number three, it's holy. If it's not those three things, it's not true love. If you're, you know, a, a struggling teenager and you want to know if it's true love, if you're in love with your boyfriend or you're in love with your girlfriend and you want to know if it's true, is it clean? Is it holy? Is it completely irregardless of yourself and how you feel? And is it completely others-oriented? They're the best of them. What's the best for them? Only. You don't even have to, you don't even think, oh, you know, but this isn't good for me. It's completely others oriented. It's completely selfless to death, almost it's just like Christ died for us. And it's completely clean. And this type of love has to be experienced. It can't be just learned. It can't be taught. I can't teach you what that is. You have to experience it with God first. And then you'll know it very, very well. And you can grow in that as your intimacy develops. A passionate love response to his pursuit is the beauty that he desires, something he can't take his eyes off. He wanted a bride that would leave everything for love and utterly cling to her beloved. God is reaching out for us, yet so, so few of us respond to his drawing. He is calling for us, yet so few answer. God's heart aches over the neglect from some of his creation. 
I always look back when, because the, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And a, a lot of us have heard that before. So I usually reflect back. If I have a, a struggling relationship with the Lord and I feel like I should be better, I look through some of the Psalms and things that David wrote and his stories and things that he went through. And I can relate somewhat and God brings me back. So I was looking at, I was looking at um, when David became aware of God's pursuit of him. And I was looking at <clears throat> Psalm 27, 8. But when he, when he was aware that God, when he finally was aware that God pursued him, he made it his resolve to respond wholeheartedly after that. And in Psalm uh, 27, 8, he said, when, when you said, Lord, <clears throat> when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Yeah? Everybody knows that one. It's so awesome to see how David actually is saying this, is when you said, seek my face, my heart, my heart said, your face I will seek. Because he knew that that's where the interaction, the transaction takes place, the intermingling of the spirit. That's where it takes place in his heart. And that's what he's looking for is the heart response. That's what God looks for. I thought that was awesome. Here we see the two longing hearts meeting. And even today, God's heart cry echoes throughout the earth. Seek my face. I just can't imagine the longing behind those words. Who will respond to them like David did? I know I, I'm going to. You can feel the passion in his voice in Isaiah 52, 50 verse 2. Why was there no man when I came? When I called, why was there none to answer? There's lots of different places in Scripture where he's, he's chasing after us and we're on the wrong page. <laughs> you know what's even more incredible to me is, wow, oh, this actually, this message with what I had what the Lord spoke to me about somebody that was listening earlier was, you know, the prodigal, he was, he was so beaten down. I mean, he did it his own doing. It wasn't God that beat him up, his own doing. And he was probably emaciated. He was tired. He was weak. And you know what? He was in that same position. And he knew that if he could just get up, that his father would receive him back maybe as a servant. And they get treated better than what he was being treated at the time. When he finally got clarity, you know, all he did was he, he got up and started his walk. At that point, he was probably so tired and emaciated and beat up with life and everything that was physically even wrong with him. He probably wasn't walking too, too fast. But that's what God was looking for, a heart response. Even when you can't, when you feel like you've been beaten down and you're tired and you're wounded and bruised and you got nowhere else to go and you can't even feel like you could turn your head to face God, or what would he want with you, right? What would he want with me? But he just needs that turning around, that, that minute, that, that, and then he'll run to you just as the father did. He saw him afar off, and the prodigal had nothing in him to run back to his father. He was probably just shuffling along, beat up, but he came running. We can take, we can take all the hope that comes from his pursuit of us to fill in our lack when we do and we receive forgiveness for the, for the lack right now even. I receive forgiveness for the lack of pursuing you back. And he will run to you. He will run to you and show you that all things are possible. Anything is possible. Arms wide open, party set up, whether you feel like you deserve it or not. Receive it. Be blessed.
because you were dead and you know, now you're alive. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So many of you in here, I just, I just keep hearing the word precious. So many people in here, he sees us all as precious pearls. We need to receive. Lord, we thank you that you, your expression to us in, in your scriptures are 100% truth, that we can fully rely on you, that we can fully accept every word, every single letter in these scriptures as 100% truth. You never fail. You never give up. You're constantly for us. You're never against us. We receive your love. We receive that fact, the truth that we are a pearl of great price that you paid everything for. Everything that you shed blood for. Whether we believe it or not, we put that aside. I receive forgiveness for not believing it. And I, <laughs> and I receive your acceptance. Oh, thank you, Father. Once we know Him, we can share Him. People will see Him instead of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. There's three simple things we can do in closing. Do you consent to the word of the Lord that came forth? That's step one. Consent. Now, yield. That's your second part. Third, drink it in. I own that. I receive it. You consent, you yield, and you obey. When you yield, the grace flows so that you can obey because it's out of that mingled, recreated human spirit that everything good takes place. Everything that takes place that's of value must be in the heart, not the head. The head must consent, but the moment you consent, you yield to the heart and obey that word. God, insofar, as I've received that word, I've received grace to perform that word and obey it. So thus saith I to the Lord, I shall obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Keep us in prayer as we develop uh, the other building, that everything goes smoothly and on time. And... Uh, Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. 
exciting courses available include the 60 day challenge, self deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.